and welcome to Calabasas, A Living History. I'm your host, Laura Nickerson. When I mention the great Chumash leader, Chief Tixlo, what comes to mind? Maybe an ancient chief from a long ago time? Well, to those who know and love the Santa Monica Mountains and outlying areas, they think of a leader whose legacy is a little bit more recent than that. Chief Tixlo's more commonly known name is Charlie Cook, and he served as a voice for the Native American community here in the area until his death in 2013. Charlie was a cowboy, father, cement truck driver, and activist who made it his goal to protect Native American sites and open spaces throughout northern Los Angeles and Ventura County. Author Mary Louise Contini Gordon wrote a book about this loved and respected leader of the Native American community titled Teak Slow, The Making of a Modern Day Chief. Author Mary Contini Gordon, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Now, first off the bat, tell me a little bit about Charlie Cook. Who was he and why is he so important to this area? Charlie is important to this area because the area probably wouldn't look the way it does today without him and his compatriots. Some of the National Park Service leadership, um, some of the state park le leadership, some of the civic leadership, who all came together to actually <laughs> follow through on Native heritage, the ideas of Native heritage and the values that went with it about the land, the sea, and even the sky because Charlie was involved with rock art paintings and solstice sites. He was involved with the national parks all across the mountains. He was involved out to Channel Islands, mm -hmm. so he was an, involved at the, in the sea. Um, and on top of that, he was a very special leader. I, when I conceived of this book, it was a long time ago, and I was the executive director of the Hughes Institute, which was the Howard Hughes Five Companies, and my job was to do executive leadership programs. And while I was interacting with CEOs and everybody at high levels in suits and with a lot of finances behind them, here was Charlie Cook, a truck driver, dressed in his truck driver clothes, uh, with really no finances at all behind him. And here he was, day after day after day, galvanizing people. Whenever there was an event that had anything to do with him, many people showed up. When there was a volunteer event, 200 people would show up easily just because he said, come, we're going to have to build trails. And they would come. Now, I want to go back to his early childhood. At what point did he stand up and say, I need to do something, I need to preserve my heritage as a Chumash Indian? That's a, an important question. Part of the theme of this book is leadership and how did that develop. I was curious about how that developed, so I went back to his childhood. Uh, even back before that, though, I have to say a little bit, the mission system took Indians, Native Americans, into the missions up and down the coast. And while they were there, they were intermarried. And so when they left, they really didn't know who they were anymore. In addition to that, they'd been given Spanish names. Many of them just didn't know who they were. Um, Charlie's m father married into a German family. Mm -hmm. And they had a German, uh, obviously, yes, some German in him. But his other side of the family was completely Indian. Mm -hmm. And so one day, after riding, in the, ra riding the range, because he was a rider at a very young age, he was about 11 at this time, and he was on the, on the other side of a shed, and the other side, there were some people talking. And he overheard someone ask his grandma, are you Indian, Mexican, or what? Actually asked his grandfather, Fred. And Grandpa Fred said Mexican. And Grandma Frances blew up. <laughs> <laughs> Why would she he said, say that? Why would well, he say he was Mexican? She said, you're Indian and don't you forget it, and, the, and you know, don't say that anymore. But the reason he said that, and many, many Indians said that, is that, um, first of all, there was a bounty on the Indian's head, a law that was not taken off the books until 1970. But that's not so much that they were afraid of, because I don't think people were actually, this was the 1940s, 1946 or 47 when he overheard this. I don't think people were taking that law at all seriously, or even knew about it. Um, but. Um, he, he and his family were discriminated against. You didn't want to say you were Indian. You wouldn't be able to buy in a liquor store, for example, um, easily. I mean, people would just kind of look at you. Uh, you know, you couldn't, yesterday, I, I talked with an Indian yesterday about this, and he was telling me that 
could, his father had trouble getting jobs if he said he was Indian. So it was just, it was discrimination. That's it what was it was. better to be Mexican than Indian at yes, the time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then what happened? Was it that that inspired him to take action? Because he, at the time, was, he was a cowboy. He was a teenager, right, at he that time? He was 11 years old. He did get involved in things like the Junior Posse, and there's some interesting stories about his adventures there. Um, he went off into the service when he graduated from high school, and when he came back, he met up with a man named Sam Kolb, um, who was, he was not Chumash, he was Luiseno, a, a different tribe. And Charlie didn't discriminate. Charlie interacted with Native Americans across all sorts of tribes and all venues. Anyway, he got involved with him and he was trying to identify people who would come out of the mission. So Charlie got, then he got involved with Vince Ibanis, who was involved with the, the freeways. The freeways were being built. And of course, what do you think? We discovered when we started digging up the road, the, ro the area for the roads, we discovered burials and we discovered artifacts. So Charlie got called in to be a monitor, or at those days they called him an observer, and that's actually what they did, an observer. Um, and so he became very interested in what is actually going on here. Where We need to save our heritage. We need to save the land. We need to do uh, what he would call reasonable development or responsible development. He just wasn't against development. He drove a cement mixer truck, by the way, a concrete right. truck. So he was, he was out there with the developers, but at the same time he was trying to say, okay, let's, if we're going to develop here, let's think about how we're going to do this. Well, and you were saying in your book that that was one of the things that inspired him as well, was when he was driving that cement truck, he noticed that he was contributing to the areas changing. So then when he started his activism, where did where was step A for him? Where did he begin? What organization did he align with, and how was he able to make some changes there? I think it crept up on him. <laughs> I don't think you can say there was one specific point. I think when he came back from the Korean War and got involved with Sam Kolb, that was probably the step that he started saying started saying, "Oh, you know, Sam was interested in all Native American heritage." Charlie was interested, and, they, and the thing he said to him, him was, you know, you're out of the San Fernando Mission. Let's find the people from the San Fernando Mission. Let's enroll them. Because at the time, the California was trying to find who was Native American, put them on what they called the rolls. Mm -hmm. And once they got on the rolls, they were identified and officially as Native American. And were there any benefits to being on the roll? There, there was some money that was paid. It wasn't very much. It was a few hundred dollars, but it, there were some benefits. But primarily, they were able to coalesce then as a group. And Charlie became the head of the Fernandeño Indians at that point. Now, he was made chief. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yes. And the title of the book is Tixlo, The Making of a Modern Day Chief. And Tixlo means Eye of the Eagle. Charlie had vision. And, and we can hopefully talk about that a little bit. But let me back up to the making of a modern day chief. Native, two mass chiefs. There were many different types of Chumas chiefs in a village. One was a Wat, which was the political chief, and that's what Charlie was. There was a spiritual leader. That's what Cote Loda was. Cote Loda called together a group of people in Santa Barbara, Oxnard area, who were known Chumash, and they asked Charlie to come to that meeting and a number of other people from more southern, northern areas too. Mm -hmm. And they concluded, after much talk, that Charlie should be their chief, their what, their political leader, because he seemed to have a bent for that. Now, there's controversy about whether he's a hereditary chief or not. The chiefs were, Watts were usually hereditary, but it really doesn't matter. He was such a, a great leader in terms of what he did with the park service and the state parks and bringing his people's heritage back. He's one of the reasons that people started to understand that Chumash are not extinct. Years ago, and it wasn't that long ago, in the 70s, people believed that Chumash were extinct, and university professors were telling archaeologists and anthropologists, don't even bother going to find them, because if you find them, they're, they really aren't real. Hmm. Um, you know, they, they may have a little bit of Indian in their family, but they really don't know anything about their heritage. Well, Charlie was, was there to tell you otherwise. <laughs> well, he was sort of described as almost a Will Rogers type of guy. People liked him. He had a great way with people. Do you think that went a long way for him being able to make the changes that he was? Absolutely. And the question is, why was he like that? And mm -hmm. I asked John Reynolds, who, who was here as assistant, one of the, the first assistant superintendent here at the Nas uh, national park sites here, I asked him, why, why did you 
deal with him so much. And by the way, John became number two in the entire National Park Service. So when I asked him this, he'd had a tremendous amount of experience with people. And he said, it was, he was just so sincere. Hmm. When he came to the park, day after day he would come. Why did you let him in day after day? You guys were busy. Because he was sincere and he knew more about the land than we did. And he knew about the heritage and we wanted to learn. His, uh, going back a little bit to his heritage, uh, the name Cook, Charlie Cook, where did that come from? There was a lot of uh, controversy about that. Yes. The, the, general, the general belief is that uh, several generations ago, there was a Lieutenant Cook who was kind to some Indians. And Charlie's, one of Charlie's ancestors noticed this. And it was during the General Fremont's time, and General Fremont was known for not being kind to the Indians. Mm -hmm. And so that man took the Cook name, William Cook. He took that name. And then after that, the name just stuck in the family. Now, he passed away in 2013, Charlie Cook. Uh, what, how was he honored by the community for all the work that he did? Tremendously. Um, throughout the book, the red-tailed hawk shows up shows up a number of times when Charlie's talking and just sits there and listens to him talk. At his memorial, which was sponsored by the National Park Service at Satwewa, which was one of the sites that he really made happen, and it's a site devoted to Native Americans of all kinds. And also, Charlie would say, to everybody. Chakot Loda, the medicine man, stooped down at his memorial service to start to light the ceremonial fire. And when he did that, Dennis, Dennis Washburn, who we are going to talk to in a few minutes, came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, look up. And two red-tailed hawks, not one, but two red-tailed hawks flew the circle a few times and then flew off. Wow. And everybody who saw it just immediately thought, wow, that's an honor of Charlie and also someone else we've not talked about, who Dennis will probably talk about some, Phil Holmes, who Charlie aligned with at the Park Service and did a lot of work with. And both of them passed away within weeks of each other. Hmm. So anyway, that was a, that was a, the red-tailed hawks were the guests of honor, I guess you would say, and um, th you know, really put a chill up my spine when I saw that. And yeah. it, was, it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. But there were many people, so many people that from, you know, he knew archaeologists, anthropologists, civic leaders, park service people, state park people, the general public. They were all there. Hmm. They were all there. What do you think he would want to pass on as a legacy? He wants people to remember that there was a Native American heritage and don't forget about it and don't forget the values that went with it in terms of actually kindness. He was a very kind man, um, caring about each other. They talk, the, the group, the Chumash people and other Native Americans do talk quite a bit about the importance of children and what you're handing down to your children. Please take care of the land. Please take care of this, the sea. And don't forget that we have a sky also that we want to take care of. So all, all of that, all our environment basically, that we want to take care of. And maybe if you're lucky, you'll look up and see some red-tailed hawks yes, circling if you're around. Lucky, and you won't if we don't take care of all of this, but you will if we do. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Dennis Washburn, one of the founding fathers of Calabasas. I'm Smith. And I'm Joe. And we're conducting an experiment to see if people like trash in their homes. Uh, yeah? Hello, sir. Please step back. What? what are you... Wait, hold on a second! Whoa! What? Uh, who are you guys? Aha! Judging from your reaction, it looks like you don't like trash in your home. No, of course not, but... Sir, this is yours. We saw you dump it out of your car on the freeway. Oh, I see. I was is California just... your home, sir? Obviously. And you don't like trash in your home? No, of course not. Then why not. would you trash California? Don't trash California. Welcome back. We're talking about the book Teak Slow, The Making of a Modern Day Chief with its author, Mary Contini Gordon. And now we're also joined by Dennis Washburn, who's a founding father of Calabasas and a former mayor. Welcome. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here. So we're talking about the Chumash Indians and Calabasas. What was this area like back in the days before the missions and the Spaniards and all of that? Well, interestingly, you know, that you would ask it that way, you know, in, in 1776, De Anza came through Calabasas, literally, 
and past the three sentinel oaks that were right at the uh, old town location in Calabasas on his way ultimately to encamp on the site of our first city hall on the west side on Las Virginis Creek. And then he took his party of 240 people up to San Francisco to found the city of San Francisco. But he came here first. <laughs> but at the time, you know, the, the Native Americans that were here had been here for 13,000 years. And, you know, when you think about that span of history, you know, that challenges our sense of what history is about anywhere on the planet, if you think about it. The Egyptian empire we think of as perhaps, you know, 5,000, 6,000 years. But here, you know, there were Shumash in California, you know, and other native tribes people here, you know, for all of that time, 13,000 years. Pretty incredible. And in terms of, you know, how they were living, they had all the food that they wanted. It was a, the area here is abundant. Uh, the climate's perfect, of course. Uh, so all plants, all animals, so they didn't need to war. They also had a monetary system. They would shell, use shell beads, actually, and the Tongva, which is a different tribe, traded with the Chumash. They traded, other tribes also traded. And then they had a boat. They made this huge ocean-going vessel that they took out to the Channel Islands. So, of course, they fished. So they had a great life, basically. So what, uh, what happened? <laughs> what changed? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, with the arrival of you know, Western Europeans and Russians as well, because they were coming down from Alaska, uh, having come across the Bering Straits from you know, the Eurasian continent. Um, we don't even know about the history of any of the Asian peoples coming in the same way, but uh, who knows, you know? But um, that history um, pretty much started to take effect in, you know, three or four hundred years ago as, you know, Drake sailed up and down the coast and other explorers, Coronado, others came through here. You know, they said, something's going on here. This is a good place. So they, they used to think that California was an island, actually, because they sailed up, you know, Baja between Mexico and um, Baja California, and they didn't ever go, all, go all the way up to the top. They figured, if, you know, we went 900 miles up that channel, it must be an island, so we'll go back out and we'll follow up on, the, on the, the western side of the island. They went all the way up to Alaska, obviously, so. Well, speaking of geography, I yeah. know you happen to have brought your very own map. <laughs> and maybe you can bring that out and show us which area we're talking about, especially one that was developed by the, the Chumash Indians. I will in tell you that there are maps in this lovely book. And that, that's what I, would, I think I, lo I liked about um, Mary's writing, is that she gave a, a, a geographic context, but it always helps, doesn't it, you know, to say you are here. Yeah. You know, National Park Service did that with their Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area brochure. And if you look at all that green, mm -hmm. that's all happened since 1978, pretty much so anyway, from Point Magoo all the way to Griffith Park, and from Point Doom in Malibu all the way up into you know, the Simi Valley, Santa Susana Hills. So and Charlie yeah. was active in all those areas, and he went even out into the desert beyond that area. Yeah, because he, he actually lived up in Leona Valley or he was, Acton. That was when he was a child. He was in Leona yeah. Valley, yes. And that's where all the cowboys were. Mm. A lot of movies were made there as well as here. As here. And Charlie fit into that as well because, you know, if there's anything about the Santa Monica Mountains, you know, it, they do contain Hollywood. And a lot of Hollywood is right here in Calabasas on top of it all, as we know from some <laughs> of the recent history. That's true. But that is, uh, yeah, very true. <laughs> but what, what are we, if we flash forward several hundred years from the time when this sure. was just Chumash and Tongva, uh, what are we looking for now? And wh what has been accomplished through uh, Charlie Cook's lifetime as far as open space preserves and maintaining some of the Native American burial sites and things like that? Well, he was active from Griffith Park all the way to uh, what we'd call Satwiwa to the western, western end of the Santa Monica Mountains. And he, let me talk about that one site because it's, it's, a, it, it's a very good representation of his thinking. Mm -hmm. He said to a group of 70 Indians who showed up there for a meeting, this should be a place for all people because there was argument. It should be Chumash because there was a Chumash village near here. It should be Tongva because we lived in this area. Oh no, it should, there are Native Americans in Los Angeles, the largest population, by the way, in the entire country because they moved here. Mm -hmm. Cherokee, Apache, any, Navajo, etc. It should be, they want it, you know, they, no, it needs to be for us too. Then there was the argument about what are we gonna call this place because 
is it Native American or is it Indian? And so right. Charlie said, Native American Indian, because we care about Samoa, it's one of our territories, we care about Alaska, and of course Hawaiians, you know, so his thinking was he wanted the land to be saved for all people. And Satwiwa was his cornerstone piece of work, but it stretched across the mountains. He what is Satwiwa exactly? Satwiwa is a site in um, the Santa Monica Mountains in Newberry Park. It was the Danielson Ranch. It, it then became the Sierra, uh, what do they call that? Rancho Sierra, Rancho Sierra Vista. Vista. Rancho <clears throat> Sierra Vista, because they went back to an old name, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, basically, when the Park Service spotted it, it was the Danielson Ranch. And that was that area is now devoted to Native Americans. There's a cultural center built there. It was designed by UCLA architecture students, and Charlie was involved with that. Um, and so that's his thinking was: no matter what park it is, whether it's Paramount Ranch or uh, King Gillette Ranch or Amundsen Ranch, which it doesn't matter. He he wanted to make sure that the land was used responsibly. Again, he was not saying you can't build anything. Yeah. But let's look at some of these pieces of land and save them for posterity. Now, Charlie wasn't um, an originator of all of this. One of the things that I think that is most important about Charlie and having reread the book again, cover to cover yesterday, um, oh. it, it 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 was clear that he was amongst the folks who were connective tissue, you know, where they take all of the experience and all of the physical out, you know, I guess outcrops, literally, you know, like Satwiwa means the cliffs um, overlooking um, the Danielson Ranch or from Rocky Oaks Park and so forth. Um, all of that needed to have a lot of time in order to formulate what the idea should be of the people who were going to be there. Now, we have about I'd say 80,000 people that are in the um, Las Virginas Unified School District here in our communities, and Calabasas, Agoura Hills, Westlake Village, um, unincorporated LA County, um, Hidden Hills, obviously Calabasas. Um, and then if you get to Thousand Oaks and you go out toward Newberry Park, you know that's still just part. Then you have all of Los Angeles, that uh, the city of Los Angeles that goes all the way to Griffith Park, mm -hmm. and that's 4.4 million people uh, now. Well, when the Native Americans were here, if there were 10, 12, 15,000 people occupying the same space, they could obviously have abundance. They could have, you know, a, a sense of pre preservation of the steelhead salmon and, you know, mountain lions and all the top predators that we have in our area. Now we have to worry about it as a society. Do you build a bridge across the 101 freeway in order to get a lion from one side to the other? in order to keep a healthy population here. Native Americans thought about that, Charlie in particular, and he would go to every meeting hmm. that anyone had to form the National Recreation Area, deal with the state parks, deal with the conservancy par uh, park lands, any of the cities or trails that were established and so forth, Charlie would be there. Hearings for developments too. And he, yeah, he'd, he'd, I mean, in fact he had relationships with many of the major developers, Chappelle Industries, Curry Rich, in Calabasas, and many of the major names you know of, he was literally driving cement. And when he was done with his day, he'd actually drive his cement truck to the park headquarters on Ventura Boulevard <laughs> near the uh, Woodlake Bowl, and he'd, he'd go and schmooze with the, the superintendent of the park, whoever it might have been at the time. And every time they would move the offices, and they're now out in Thousand Oaks on Hillcrest, right? Um, and at King Gillette Ranch, he'd show up. Sometimes it just takes passion to inspire and, projects. And being there. And being and showing up. Showing up. And showing up. <laughs> uh, when you were, showed up quite a bit when we were creating Calabasas, was there any thought given at the time to the Chumash culture, to preserving that, to preserving the op open spaces in this particular area? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, a prime motivating factor for the forma formation of all the cities on the 101 corridor, and Malibu for that matter, was to basically uh, call a halt to the massive you know, development and change of the landscape that was going on. Not to be anti-development, some were, some weren't. Calabasas, in fact, didn't have a moratorium on building, and we met literally you know, once or twice a week to deal with all the pressure that was on us because of the way everybody 
who wanted to come out here, they were going to love the land to death. <laughs> you know, they were going to just take over. And when you do that, you lose the chance for the appreciation of the space, the place. And it's, you know, the soil, water, energy, atmosphere. It's all a part of what native culture appreciated and uh, fully realized because they knew that that's all they had. They had to live and eat and raise their children and yeah, plan their culture. It wasn't incidental, it was, it was survival. It was survival, yeah. exactly. There, there was um, one person I talked to who said when Charlie came and talked to us and we went out with him to the sites, because he would go with National Park sites, and National Park Service people and um, other authorities out to sites, and um, he'd say, well, he would tell us, you know, this is not just a scraggly hillside, because we have scraggly hillsides around here. <laughs> yeah. It's not a scraggly hillside. This is where the Indians lived. This is what they ate. This is what they did in, when there was no water. This is how mm -hmm. they handled it when there was no water, which we know happens here periodically. <laughs> yeah, like now, yes. Or when the fires came. Or when the or fires, when the came. fires mm -hmm. came. And he would explain that, and then people would say, wow, this, this is important. This is a, a, an important place. It's not just a scraggly hillside. It makes it relatable to people. Um, just in closing here, what kind of a message do you think we should send forward with this book, with Charlie's legacy, with our hopes for this area? I would hope that people would read the book and understand that um, he, Charlie is one man and that there are many people in this world who dedicate their lives to something and deserve to deserve the rest of us to know about them and their tremendous dedication. In his case, he would want the world to know that the world is a very special place. The Native Americans felt the world is, we don't own any land, that was their attitude. We need to take care of it. We are stewards of it. And that's the message I believe that he talked about over and over again, sometimes with not talking, but just example. Mm -hmm. And um, I, that's the message I think he leaves and the legacy he leaves. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dennis Washburn. Thank you to you, Mary Contini Gordon. Thank you for writing such a lovely book. Thank you for having me and having Dennis. All right. The name of the book is Teak Slow, The Making of a Modern Day Chief and can be found at A-M-P-U-B-B-O-O-K-S dot com. I hope you've enjoyed getting to know the well-loved and respected Charlie Cook and that his efforts at preservation have inspired you to get involved in your own efforts. For more information on CTV or the City of Calabasas, visit our website at cityofcalabasas.com. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Calabasas, A Living History. I'm Laura Nickerson.